so I'll actually, uh, um, I'll, uh, I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kuli nations on whose land we are gathered today. I pay my respects to the elders past and present. So welcome again to today's Linguistic Justice uh, Society Seminar. It is my pleasure to welcome today our speaker, Dr. Alexandra Gray from the University of Technology in Sydney. Uh, Alexandra will present a paper titled Linguistic Inclusion and Good Governance in Multilingual Australia. Uh, Alexandra is a Chancellor's Research Fellow at the University of Technology Sydney in the Faculty of Law. Uh, at this seminar draws on work uh, that she published in the conversation, the Griffith Law Review with Ali Severin, uh, and recently in the Sydney Law Review. Uh, Alexandra is also the author of uh, Language Rights and the Change in China, a National Overview uh, and Zhuang Case Study. Um, free Mandarin excerpts and an overview in Zhuang are available from a, a link that I'll be able to provide to those of you uh, who are interested in this. I believe this information was also circulated with the original um, seminar invitation. Uh, her new research examines the role of the state in Aboriginal language renewal in Australia. Alexandra runs the Law and Linguistic Interdisciplinary Researchers Network, uh, which uh, workshop attendees are welcome to join. Again, there's a link in the original email um, that was circulated by uh, the Linguistic Justice Society webinar conveners. But if you forgot or if you lost it, please feel free to be in touch with me or Alex, uh, and we'll be able to provide you with the link. Uh, so I will uh, I will stop here. Uh, uh, I will uh, let um, uh, Alex start with the, with the presentation. So um, Alexandra will speak for about forty five minutes, and and then that will be followed by uh, Q and A's. If you have any issues, technical and so on, just feel free to put them in the chat. Um, maybe directly to me rather than to everyone. If they're just uh, individual to you, I will try to deal with them as soon as possible. Uh, and um, yeah, then for the Q&A, feel free to either use the, the Zoom uh, hand or, or to just put your question in the chat uh, and make sure that um, all the uh, questions are then uh, relate to, to Alex. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, please, Alex, feel free to start. Okay, good morning. And uh, I'll do an acknowledgement as well in Gadi language. Nini Nalawangun Mari Bajuri Gadi Nurida. I acknowledge that um, we meet um, on the unceded lands of the Gadi people where my home university, University of Technology Sydney, is based in the centre of what is now Sydney. Now, can I just check if I share my screen, will that work for you? If not, I have only a couple of slides and they're not integral. Um, can you see my share screen? Not so far from my end. Mm. My end. Okay, what I'm going to do very quickly um, is email that to you, Matteo, and perhaps yeah. you can share the screen. Sure. Um, from my end, I think it's because there's um, a setting on my computer. It seems that um, doesn't allow me to share. It's a privacy setting. Okay, but never mind. I'll, I'll share it. If you, did you email it to me? I just emailed it. To yeah, you. yeah. I'll, we don't we don't need another slide yet. So that's all right. You can set that up, and I'll begin talking. So I'll have to um, begin, of course, by just acknowledging my host and chair today, Matteo, and his colleagues Sergi and Yale, and the other linguistic justice seminar conveners who've arranged this opportunity for me to speak about my research. Very grateful for that, and overall for the webinars that they have organized, the whole program of them are energizing and driving forward this fledgling linguistic justice society that we founded. And I'm also very grateful to everyone who's here online, um, particularly if you've tuned in in the middle of the night. Um, I know many of you are here in Australia where it's Friday morning. As I mentioned in my acknowledgement, I'm at uh, the University of Technology, Sydney. For those of you who know a little about my research, you may know that I focus both on China and Australia, but this talk is exclusively about my recent years of Australian research. And specifically, this presentation reports on research I began in 2018 uh, on good governance in multilingual urban Australia. That was the name of the project and it was funded by the University of Sydney. And over the years 2018 to 21, that project included three studies. 
The first was a study about legislation and policy for a decision-making framework and standards which might underlie multilingual government communications. That study focused on Australia's largest state, which is called New South Wales. The second study was about the outputs of uh, communication processes, and in particular, websites of the New South Wales government. And my uh, colleague, Dr. Alyssa Severin from Macquarie University came on board for those two studies. Okay. Um, hold on, Matteo, I just minimize Zoom for myself because now that's blocked my speaker notes. There we go. Okay. And the third study was specifically on COVID-19 communications from governments in Australia, not just New South Wales, but also the Australian National Government. Now, each of these studies have been written up and published, and you have the links to those publications in the invitation to this webinar in the bio section. And I'll put them up again at the end in the reference slide for this presentation. Sorry, Alex, do you want me to, um, to move on to the third style you're still at the beginning? Uh, no, that's fine. You can you can keep it on that slide for okay. the moment. I only have a couple of slides just to illustrate some key findings throughout. Most of it is um, just me talking, so you can even stop share screen if you want. Okay, so in this webinar, I'm going to present the key findings of each of the three studies and then draw them together by asking an overarching question, and that is whether developments in government's public communications during the COVID pandemic left Australia with any lasting improvements in terms of linguistic and social inclusion. And I have no doubt that a very similar question could be asked about lasting changes from the pandemic in countries where people in the audience may live, multilingual government communications and social inclusion are big issues around the world and the pandemic only made that more clear than ever. Let me just briefly explain the Australian context um, and then I'll move on to uh, the key findings of the, the studies. Uh, those of you in Australia, just bear with me for this brief overview and perhaps even you will learn something. So the first point to make for those unfamiliar with Australia is that it is a federation. It has a national government, but also six state governments. So I mentioned that the first two of my studies focus on one of those states, a state called New South Wales. It's the most populous state in Australia. Sydney is the capital of New South Wales, and it has long been Australia's largest city at over 5 million people, although just very recently Melbourne has equalised. Okay, and the second point to note is that Australia is increasingly linguistically diverse. The last census shows that a language other than English is used in at least 22% of households. In some parts of Sydney and and in other metropolitan areas in Australia, that rate is above 70%. Now, because of people's progressive acquisition of English, the number of people who speak little to no English is roughly consistent, census on census. New people become part of that group and other people become more competent English speakers and move out of that group. Ingrid Pillar, the applied linguist in a 2020 webinar, which I'll put up in the reference list at the end, numbers that, that um, group of people who speak little to no English as roughly 800,000 people. Now, of course, the particular language other than English that these people use may be one of very many, it's a wide range, and the languages change over time depending on currents of migration. And then, of course, there are people who speak some English but cannot read it or who cannot use English sufficiently well to understand government communications. So that is in addition to the people who on a census would be reported as having little to no English. So this broader group I call non-English dominant minority. And then there are various types of multilingualism. In Australia, a variety of newer migrant languages are spoken, but migrants who arrived from the mid 20th century may still also be speaking a language other than English at home. Those languages are Greek, Italian, Cantonese, Arabic. In addition, 
There are first language speakers of some Australian Indigenous languages, and while those uh, those speakers may also speak English, it may be a variation that is quite different from standard Australian English. And so in what I think is a telling quote, the applied linguists Phil Benson and Aniko Hatosh say about Sydney, the only linguistic enclaves in Sydney are, in fact, those suburbs that tend to persist around the outer fringes of the city, which are largely composed of monolingual English speakers. So that is the rarity, if you like, that is the abnormal situation. And because of this diversity, communicating in just, say, the most commonly used languages other than English, like Mandarin and Arabic, which are the most highly spoken languages in New South Wales and nationally, will not cater to the language needs of a sizable minority of the public. And indeed, there have been indications that even the existing government communications in languages such as Mandarin and Arabic have not been catering to the language needs of segments of the public to whom such communications are directed. I won't go through all those indications now, but I'll just point quickly to one report from another state government, the Victorian government in 2007, and it supports the view that existing public communications in languages other than English may languish as underused resources because of a lack of shared knowledge between the government providers and the intended recipients. This is a pernicious problem, as you can imagine, because the mere existence of these materials in languages other than English can lead to government complacency about their accessibility or their uptake. And so I began my project knowing that there was probably a problem with multilingual communications, but also I found that pre-existing research about multilingual government communications in Australia was scarce. And against the backdrop of Australia's known linguistic diversity, I began my project with an interest in two types of inclusion. Firstly, what we might call structural, in the sense of I wanted to know how are diverse language groups involved in the production and revision of government's multilingual public communications. So what structures are there for inclusion in this particular aspect of governing? And then I was also interested in a second question of social inclusion. To what extent do government communications reach diverse groups, either to bring them into the sphere of knowledge or, and this is important, to build their trust in government through choice of language and to build their sense of being represented by this government? So the first study, I've called it an audit. The main data of this one was law and policy. I intended to gather it from all Australian states and the national level, but I began with New South Wales. And by 2019, I was underway with an audit of New South Wales law and policy that does or does not provide a framework for decision making and standards of multilingual public communications. And at this point, I'll just clarify that when I say public communications, I mean those directed at a mass audience, rather than say private communications from a government to specific individuals. And so these public communications are often standardized, written or audiovisual texts that are disseminated via official websites or in printed publications, in television ads, on the radio. So back then in 2019, I was also starting to collect these sorts of standard public texts from the New South Wales government, web pages, signage, etc. And that corpus of actual communications became the focus of my second study. And I was starting interviews with the creators of such communications. And I'll just note here my thanks to my research assistant and eventual co-author, Dr. Ali Severin from Macquarie, who came on board to collaborate with me from this point. Now, of course, the COVID meteor hit in 2020 and the research climate changed overnight. My in-progress audit froze over, if you like. As I will describe further in a minute, a new third research stream opened up specifically in relation to COVID communications, but the more negative impact was that I could no longer complete the audits of law in jurisdictions other than New South Wales. So in the first of a few indications of projects other people may want to take up, doing a law and policy audit um, of other New South Wales, uh, other Australian jurisdictions is, is one I suggest. So this first audit came to focus on New South Wales. 
Now, we hypothesise that the New South Wales government's public communications are not made within a clear or informed decision-making framework as to choice of language and do not consistently acknowledge, plan for or manage the public's linguistic diversity. And this was borne out. The audit found that the New South Wales Parliament rarely acts to intervene in any aspect of language youth, uh, use, either by the public or by, um, sorry, either by public or private individuals or entities. Um, not only does it rarely control government communications, it rarely can, if you like, regulate communications overall. What we did was to search a free database called Ostley. Uh, Ostley's New South Wales Consolidated Acts for pieces of legislation that contain the term English or the term language. Then we had to work through and exclude uh, some that were actually irrelevant, for example, using the word English to mean um, a person from England. And we, we narrowed down to 91 New South Wales Acts, so pieces of legislation that contained English or language. And then we coded them to create a typology of regulation about language of communication. And I'll talk you through only the three most prevalent types of law that we found now. And Matteo, if you like, you could put up uh, slide number two. Thank you. So here we have the three most common types of law about language in New South Wales were laws that protect, protect people, not languages, laws about record keeping, and laws about acknowledging linguistic diversity. 40 of the acts in our study protect people by requiring that rights or obligations or information are explained to vulnerable types of people in language they understand. However, not being an English speaker or not being literate in English is generally not recognised as a type of vulnerability in these acts. Rather, it's vulnerability, for example, being a child, being a person with mental illness, these sorts of vulnerabilities. Most of these acts create a form of protection by setting a statutory standard that certain government representatives need to communicate in an understandable way, but without stating exactly how they are to communicate. So the standard that such acts require is unclear, and variously phrased. It might be plain language, it might be ordinary language, simple language, or language likely to be understood. There is no mention that this language needs to be in a language other than English sometimes. Rather, these standards seem, at least implicitly, to be about making English more understandable. And in addition, there are no statutory mechanisms in this act, these acts to scrutinize or to assure the quality of these regulated communications. So we may ask what's to be done if the required simple language is not provided. The second most common type of New South Wales legislation about choice of language was about keeping records in English or with English translations for the government to use or review. So for example, types of company record. Through these requirements, the state ensures its own linguistic limitations are overcome. Although, as the audit shows, the state does not always reciprocally overcome others' linguistic limitations. And the third most common type of law that we found was laws that simply acknowledge linguistic diversity or stipulate that certain organisations must acknowledge it. These are not laws providing rules about how or when to use languages other than English. However, one quite particular act within this group is the Multicultural New South Wales Act, and it does two interesting things. First, it declares New South Wales multicultural principle, which is on the screen, that all individuals and institutions should respect and make provision for culture, language, and religion of others within an Australian legal and institutional framework where English is the common language. So does this mean that all of those variously worded requirements that I just mentioned about communicating in language that certain vulnerable people can understand include an obligation to communicate in languages other than English 
where that is what will make the communication understandable? Arguably so. But this argument has never been made politically or prosecuted in a court, to my knowledge. The second interesting thing that the Multicultural New South Wales Act does is to require a certain kind of policy called a multicultural plan to be made by government departments. And these multicultural plans were one of the only kinds of policy document that we could access and collect in our attempt to audit government policy. Specifically, we were looking into New South Wales government policy to determine whether policy maybe filled the gap that we were finding in the legislative framework. In short, not much. Only the Department of Education and the Department of Health published their multicultural plans publicly. So there, might, there should and may well be multicultural plans for much of the New South Wales government, but it's not publicly available to review. Both of those two plans that we could find touch on the language of public communications, but don't make that a focus. They are primarily concerned with individual multilingual communication. So, for example, situations where an interpreter is used. The other relevant policy available in New South Wales is called the Government Advertising Guidelines. And in general, these guidelines divide government advertising or government um, information campaigns into various brackets, depending on how much the overall campaign costs, and then put particular conditions. But in general, the condition is that government advertising must reflect the cultural and linguistic diversity of New South Wales, and at least 7.5% of the campaign budget is to be spent, the campaign media budget is to be spent on direct communications to multicultural and Aboriginal audiences. So when the government follows these rules, it does often produce some of its advertising or some of its information campaigns in languages other than English. But these guidelines say nothing about the content, the medium, which language should be chosen, whether to test these multilingual communications with linguistically diverse groups before rolling them out et cetera, et cetera. There's very little actual guidance on how those multilingual communications should turn out. So while there was very little law and only a little policy, because there was the multilingual, the multicultural principle, and because there were just these few policies that I've summarised, we nevertheless concluded that there is enough of an official framework in New South Wales that the question how do government language choices differentially affect different language groups should nowadays be asked when decisions about New South Wales government's public communications are being made. And overall, this first study argues that more consistent law or policy should guide the New South Wales government's public communications to enable the government to more readily fulfill the communicative and representative needs of its constituents. Now, the second study was of New South Wales communications practices. So it's an empirical examination of web-based communications from all 10 New South Wales government departments and 18 of the government agencies. And in the paper from 2022, you can see how we selected uh, those agencies now and why we selected websites specifically. When we looked at the websites of the agencies, four of them linked back to departmental websites. So in total, we had not 10 plus 18, but 10 plus 14, 24 websites in total to examine. We manually investigated the multilingualism of these 24 government websites by recording and quantifying the languages used on each. We separately recorded the languages available through translation widgets and you can read more about that in the paper, but I won't focus on the translation uh, widgets today. We counted a website as using a particular language when it either used that language on the site itself. So for example, in the text or in an image of text or in embedded audio, or when it linked to fact sheets or other materials which used that language, regardless of how little or how much of that language was used. But then separately, we also 
examined how much or little of each language there was. And we also noted how or whether these pages and materials directed the public elsewhere to communications in languages other than English that might be on other websites. The study identifies that the New South Wales government does make some effort to publicly communicate in languages other than English, but it also identifies problems with such communications. And in particular, the problems we found was a lack of consistency, a lack of predictability across the websites in relation to the range of languages used, the amount of content in languages other than English, and the steps by which it could be accessed. So first, the languages used on the 24 government websites included English and overall 64 languages other than English. But six, so 25% of the websites used only English. And the only language used across all the sites was English. Now on the next slide here, thank you, Mateo, you can see the range of all those 64 other languages. So it's a huge range. We found that if content in a language other than English was present on a department or agency website, then it included content in a variety of Mandarin Chinese, whether it was labeled Mandarin or traditional Chinese or simplified Chinese or Chinese. It also, if it included language other than English content, it included Vietnamese content. And in almost all cases, it also included Arabic. Now, Chinese, Vietnamese, Arabic, these three almost constant languages other than English are three of the four most constantly used languages other than English in New South Wales. And so the choices of the New South Wales government do, to some degree, reflect the demographic makeup of the population. However, and this is where we might move to the next slide, only eight of those 64 languages other than English, so only about 12.5%, appear on at least half the websites. So there's a real inconsistency of use. And those eight, even those eight, do not correspond to the eight most frequently used languages other than English in New South Wales. And moreover, if a New South Wales government website uses languages other than English at all, it is likely to use over a dozen but whether it will include two dozen or three dozen or four dozen languages is uncertain. And the second major issue is then how those languages are used. So let me focus specifically on how this content in languages other than English could be accessed on the websites. Other researchers have identified what they've called a monolingual logic of information architecture that re reduces accessibility. And here I'm quoting from Pillar, Bruzon and Torsh in a paper they wrote about Department of Education websites in the journal Language and Education. In short, when we looked across New South Wales government websites, we found the same, a monolingual logic of information architecture. Language other than English content appeared to us to be treated by the majority of these government entities as a resource for English speaking professionals or other English speaking intermediaries to disseminate. There were exceptions and I'll note them um, to highlight some good work. The um, uh, Family and Community Services website, the Independent Commission Against Corruption, Multicultural New South Wales and the New South Wales Elec Electoral Commission did at least provide links on the homepages to content in languages other than English with those links labelled in languages other than English. That is, you could read it even if you couldn't read English. Moreover, though, language other than English information was less extensive than the information in English. And at this point in the paper, we do a close-up of one website, that is the website of Fire and Rescue New South Wales, to really illustrate this lack of extensive information in languages other than English. So what you might find interesting and something I find interesting is a link between the two papers. The New South Wales Law and Policy Audit found that New South Wales Health had more policy guidance through its multicultural plan 
about public communications than any other department or agency appeared to. Then when we looked at government communications practices in this second study, we found that New South Wales Health used many more languages other than English in its web-based public communications compared to other New South Wales departments. Albeit still with some potentially significant barriers to accessing that content. So this raises the question, does the policy cause the improved practice or are both the outcomes of some other cause within the Department of Health? Overall, the actual New South Wales government website communications that we analysed did not appear to meet the standards set in the Multicultural New South Wales Act, from which I quoted earlier, because provisions are not reliably or thoroughly made for non-English dominant speakers and readers. So the second study bolsters the call that we made in the first for more informed and more strategic communications policy. It's not our argument that the New South Wales government should necessarily spend more money on multilingual public communications, although that may help, and if it does help, good. Rather, what we are suggesting is that it should spend money on multilingual public communications in an informed and strategic way so that it is more effective and in a way that is accountable both to policy and to the multilingual public. Now, the third study is the one that focuses on COVID communications. As the COVID pandemic endured, my project came to focus more narrowly. This was necessary both in terms of what I could do and also useful in terms of foregrounding an especially high stakes aspect of my broader concern, the exclusion of linguistic minorities from government's COVID communications. First, the study empirically examines COVID communications from 2020, which were physically displayed in public places, so primarily posters, in four highly linguistically diverse suburbs. And then it also empirically examines COVID communications online from government websites and government social media accounts. Part of this study also gathered together the media and government reporting on COVID communications during 2020 and 2021 as well to track what was being reported about hurdles or improvements or problems with the campaign to inform people about the basic response to COVID, about the lockdowns, and then in 2021, the vaccination information campaign. So I did this one by myself, but my earlier work with Elisa Severin my pre-pandemic research in New South Wales had found that online public communications from the New South Wales government were unpredictable and inconsistent in their language choices, not aligned with the linguistic profile of the public, likely to be in English, likely to be communicated in writing across departments and agencies. And overall, the COVID case study found the same shortcomings in New South Wales and federal pandemic public health communications. Although multilingual government communications were produced and they became not only quite numerous, but arguably better as the pandemic went on. And I think the government's goodwill and effort in that regard is important to highlight. It's moving in the right direction. My COVID case study has a second component. This is a review of the international commentary from international organisations as to how to make a human rights-based approach to pandemic communications in order to fulfill certain international law obligations upon Australia and upon other nations. The commentary I reviewed comprises publications from international organisations which are influential but not binding in international law. And these include general comments from the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is accorded weight in determining what the realisation of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights entails. That's an international treaty to which Australia is a party. The other commentary I reviewed was reports by UN Special Rapporteurs, guidelines, plans and reports from international organisations such as the World Health Organisation, the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, 
and the Council of Europe's Committee of Experts on the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. So this review found new expectations are emerging in the international discourse about how governments should communicate about health in multiple languages. And specifically, I draw out the themes of those expectations. There is a growing expectation that multilingual health communications be not merely partially available, but rather produced without unreasonable linguistic discrimination, produced with minority communities' involvement at preparatory stages, produced after strategic planning, and produced with an eye to effectiveness. And in explaining what more effective multilingual communications could entail, in the paper I advocate assessing government communications in terms of availability, accessibility, acceptability, and adaptability. And that is, as some of you may rec recognize, the four A's recognized by the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in relation to education communications and recognized by crisis communication scholars and applied linguists. For example, Pillar, Zhang and Li, who in 2020 wrote about how China improved its COVID communications, highlighting these four A's. So in analyzing the Australian case study in light of the international guidance, the article concludes that although Australian COVID communications were available in a relatively high number of languages, they were characterized by inefficiencies and limited community input and limited strategic planning, leaving Australia arguably still falling short of progressively realizing its right to health obligations. Now, these shortfalls should be ameliorated given Australia's obligations under the covenant. And they could be ameliorated by heeding that international guidance that I've just briefly summarized. So let's draw these three pieces of the study together. We saw some consistent concerns across all three papers, in particular about a lack of a guiding framework and a patchy practice of multilingual government communications. Both the inclusion of non-dominant users of English in the process of producing government communications and the indexical use of languages to signal or to build social inclusion are unpredictable. But I also noted that multilingual COVID communications did seem to improve in some respects over time during the pandemic. And certainly there was more attention paid to problems with multilingual government communications because of the pandemic's high stakes. So has that given Australia any lasting improvements in linguistic and social improvement, uh, linguistic and social inclusion? Is that attention on the problems being maintained? Ultimately, to answer those questions, we need to keep monitoring and keep analyzing over the next few years. But here are a few points to draw out of the studies that I think will be useful for an ongoing answer to that question. The first is something I highlight that's a legal aspect, but I highlight it as a tool for advocacy and a justification for further research. And this is that Australia's international human rights law obligation is that any advances made in multilingual health communications in response to COVID should be sustained after the pandemic unless there are good justifications for unwinding those improvements. That's how the International Covenant on Economic, um, Social and Cultural Rights works. The progressive realization of health rights ratchets forward. And so the committee that interprets this covenant in its general comment number three has held that any deliberately retrogressive measures would require the most careful consideration and would need to be fully justified by reference to the totality of the rights provided for in the covenant and in the context of the full use of the maximum available resources. However, sustaining those improvements for this reason is only in relation to health communications because it relates to the right to health. While on the topic of health communications, 
Something else that my research highlights is that differential COVID outcomes can be understood as highlighting linguistic exclusion as one of the social determinants or one of the dimensions of the social determinants of ill health. And I highlight this as a connection point for public health, health research, which already investigates the social determinants of health, but does not seem to see or to foreground linguistic exclusion within those social determinants. And then moving from health communications to the broader issue, I started to use the term communicative justice in my third study to frame the research. It comes from the anthropologist, Charles Briggs, who is an anthropologist of medicine. He draws together different fields of scholarship to pursue what he calls in a 2020, uh, 2017 paper, communicative justice in health by seeing how health inequalities are entangled with communicative inequalities. Now, in my view, this communicative justice theme or label prompts those of us doing research or those of you inside government to draw together knowledge from across disciplines in order to solve real problems of inequality through inquiry into their social contexts. Or to put it another way, to examine communication as part of the social framework that sustains inequality. The term linguistic justice, the name of today's host society, itself does similar work and is a cross-disciplinary label. Now, the remaining highlights that I will make are suggestions for applying the research to policy and practice, community input. This is something the research shows as something lacking, something recommended in the international discourse. And this is the main aspect in which Australia's multilingual government communications were said to improve during the COVID years. However, proactive community involvement and co-design is not yet embedded. The possibility of embedding such activity brings us to the need for strategic planning and even regulatory guidance. The earlier two studies showed in different ways that this was largely absent. And my COVID study suggests this, this has not been fixed. In relation to community input, I also want to notice and help us avoid a potential conflict of purposes. On the one hand, leveraging the public's linguistic resources can assist a government to use more languages and use them better. But this can also lead, on the other hand, to an abrogation of government duty, governments leaving it to communities to interpret for each other. However, this does not have to be the way it pans out. And I want to stress this ought not be the continued situation. First, in principle, relying on intermediaries does not respect each member of the public's entitlement to information or to autonomous informed decision-making. And I don't think this point is made often enough. And the second point is that relying on intermediaries may also be an unfounded reliance by governments, as Ali Severin and I have pointed out. So I'm not advocating that bilingual or multilingual community members and pre-existing community networks should be ignored. Rather, I'm saying they should be recognised, but also funded and brought into the communications process. New South Wales Multicultural Health Communications Service, which is a uh, an agency in New South Wales, actually seems to do this comparatively well. But as my third paper points out, they're a very unusual government agency Australia-wide. Some local councils in New South Wales also seem to be developing communications with good community partnerships. The role of local governments in multilingual government communications is a separate line of research in waiting that I also invite someone in the audience to pursue. And on this point of final note, I suggest that we could ask other countries for language service assistance as part of strategic planning. This would align with another key theme that I found was emerging in the international pandemic commentary, the theme of international solidarity. I suggest at the end of paper three, that while qualified translators of the languages of new and small migrant groups might often be in short supply within Australia, by contrast, they may be abundant in another country where that language is neither new nor small. 
Now, I have not found any such suggestion in the literature. These dots of international solidarity and planning for linguistic inclusion are yet to be connected, but I suggest that we do start connecting them. And my final recommendations are specifically about the kind of hurdles that we need to know to be warned of and to overcome in this kind of research. The three studies gave me a real awareness of two kinds of barrier quite apart from COVID. The first is that this kind of research tends to accumulate voluminous data. Lots and lots of actual government communications are produced in many different media. And so the work of analysing them may require more than the one or two team members that we had for this project. And the second issue is that the relevant policies, the practices themselves and the data about how those government communications have been received may not be publicly accessible, even if they do exist. So without knowing whether they exist and without seeing them, you can't answer questions like, how are the communications decisions actually being made within government? Or who writes the text? How are communities consulted? Is there someone within government collecting on collecting data on whether multilingual communications were quote unquote successful or reached audiences? Now, I unfortunately found it incredibly hard to get university ethics committee approval to observe government communications work in practice, at least for the kind of institutional ethnography that I had hoped to do, or to recruit interview participants via the management of a government organization. And of course, it also takes a long time to build up trust with a government agency or department to do this kind of collaboration or to share their internal data. For what it's worth, my impression is that the closer a government is to multilingual community members in its everyday operations, the more willing it is to cooperate with a researcher on this sort of project. Thus, local councils seem to me to see our interests as aligning, and they were in some cases already undertaking some data collection about community language needs. Whereas the more removed or higher up the government, the more they may be prone to distrust or concern about scrutiny or actually have less internal data already collected. So the overview, the final takeaway is what I've got up on the screen here. These three studies have led me to suggest what I'm calling the three R's in response to recurrent problems in government communications reaching and including linguistically diverse publics. The first is further research, and for the reasons I've just explained, preferably in collaboration with government. The second is redesigning communications and their access routes. So that is such that the quality and the accessibility are improved, even for the resources that are already produced. And the third is rights-based regulation, and that is to uphold standards to strategically plan and to enable governments to be held account for their multilingual communications practices. Now, while I have wrapped up this particular project, I would love to stay in conversation with people doing similar work. So please drop me an email or stay in touch via the Law and Linguistics Interdisciplinary Researchers Network, which is an online network that I co-organize and which all listeners are welcome to join. The link is up there on the screen or via direct email to me. Or of course, you can stay in touch by beginning a conversation right now as we have plenty of time for questions. So thank you again for your attention and I'll hand back to Matteo. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, uh, please join me in thanking Alex for this great presentation. So I will stop the recording now, actually. Why don't um, we just put up the references slide quickly so that's captured sure. in the recording for anyone who looks at this later on. Great. Okay. There are the references if you're listening at home or listening later on and you want to follow up on something. And of course, you can just email me to get a copy of any of my papers as well.